Hello and welcome to our audience members joining us from across the globe. I'm Raymond Karam, the Chief Program and Development Officer here at AGSIW. I'm delighted to welcome you all to today's program, looking at the efforts led by some Arab countries to re-engage with the regime of Bashar al-Assad and the merits of such efforts. Uh, we have a truly uh, all-star panel of experts uh, with us today. I'll introduce them very briefly here and share a link to their full bios in the chat with all of you. Uh, first, I'd like to welcome Sam Heller, an analyst and fellow at Century International. Uh, his work focuses on po politics and security in Lebanon, Syria, and their regional neighborhood. He has published extensively with Crisis Group and the Century Foundation and for outlets including Foreign Affairs, War on the Rocks, and the Daily Beast. Uh, I should mention that Sam's latest piece in Foreign Affairs inspired this panel, and I will share a link to it in the chat with you all. Uh, also, warm, warm welcome to Ambassador James Jeffrey. Ambassador Jeffrey joined the Wilson Center in December 2020 as chair of the Middle East program. He uh, previously served as a special representative for CRI engagement and the special envoy to the global coalition to defeat ISIS. He is a former U senior US diplomat with experience in political security and energy issues in the Middle East, Turkey, Germany, and the Balkans. I'm also happy to welcome back Darin Khalifa, the senior advisor for dialogue promotion at Crisis Group. Previously, she was a senior analyst at Crisis Group focused on security, conflict, politics, and governance in Syria. She has a long experience working on the Middle East with a particular focus on uh, sub-state armed group dynamics, local governance, and civil society. Uh, last but not least, we're happy to have with us Mona Yakubia, uh, the uh, Vice President of the Middle East and North Africa Center at USIP. She has more than 30 years of experience working on the Middle East and North Africa, centered on conflict analysis, governance, and conflict prevention. Since returning to USIP, her uh, work has focused on Syria, Lebanon, and Iraq. In 2019, she served as the executive director of the congressionally mandated Syria Study Group, which USIP was appointed to facilitate. Moderating, moderating the session today is Ambassador Bill Roebuck, uh, the executive vice president of AGSIW. He most recently served as the deputy special envoy to the Global Coalition to Defeat ISIS and a senior advisor to the special representative for CRI engagement. He served as the U.S. ambassador to Bahrain from 2015 to 2017. Uh, and with that, Bill, over to you. Thank you, Raymond. Welcome, everyone, to this AGSIW program on Syria today. I wanted to start uh, with a quick review of the situation on the ground. Before we get into our discussion, I'll keep it very short, but just to give people an overview. So there's a military stalemate in Syria since 2020. It's been reinforced with a series of ceasefires and understandings, but periodic violence as well as instability and protests still regularly occur. For example, recent clashes in northeast Syria have occurred between Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces and Arab fighters. That's killed at least 90 people. It's unclear if the fighting is contained or if it will continue to spread in Deir Zor province. And I should note that the SDF is the local partner uh, for the U.S. in the fight against ISIS. And the Arab fighters that they have been fighting have also cooperated in that effort in the past. There have been anti-regime protests in the southern province of Soweda. These are continuing into the third week, fueled by economic hardship and reduction of fuel subsidies. Their, un their unrest is a bit unusual in this Druze-majority province since it is under regime control. Airstrikes on Aleppo airport attributed by media to Israel occurred in late August. In addition to uh, these events on the uh, violence and unrest side, you have an economy in freefall, there's spiraling inflation and a Syrian currency plunging to unheard of levels. 15,500 Syrian pounds to the dollar last month, and a dire humanitarian situation with 90% of Syrians living below the poverty line. Meanwhile, you have Arab countries. Since 2018, they have begun a process of gradual normalization with the Assad regime, reopening embassies, and receiving the long shunned Syrian president for official visits. It's a process that culminated with Saudi restoration of bilateral diplomatic ties in early May and Assad's May 19 welcome at the Arab League summit in Jeddah. Sam, I'm going to start our discussion with you. You've written a sturdy, provocative piece in foreign affairs recently, The Upsides of Syrian Normalization. You state in your article that 
Arab normalization with Damascus is the right move, despite the regime's use of uh, chemical weapons, its brutality, uh, and so forth. Why do you say that, uh, Sam? Make the case for us to kick off our discussion this morning. Uh, well, thanks for the uh, the introduction, uh, and then glad to be here. Um, I mean, so first, I'd just like to say, I mean, I think we need to, I need to specify here who I'm making the case to, right? Because I don't think I need to make this case to these uh, Arab governments. They know, they're convinced, right? And they're already doing it. Uh, so the case that I tried to make in the course of my, uh, or in my foreign affairs article, uh, was a case to uh, the U.S. and other Western governments uh, on for uh, how to react to this, right? I mean, how to engage with uh, the initiative that, uh, you know, many U.S. Western Arab partners are already taking. Uh, I mean, when it comes to these uh, uh, Arab governments, I think they, at least my um, understanding uh, of their uh, perspective here uh, is that they know that the, uh, the status quo until now uh, has not been good for them. Um, that Syria's continued uh, isolation um, is not a, a not a positive thing. Um, we have uh, because recently we've had uh, an isolated, uh, economically crushed Syria um, exporting instability regionally, right? So it's not just uh, not taking back refugees. Uh, there is continued migration uh, out of the country from. It seems uh, all areas of control. Uh, Syria has become a uh, uh, a producer and uh, exporter of drugs, uh, including uh, the amphetamine captagon, and a, uh, a staging ground for various uh, non-state militant groups. Um, so I think, you know, I think that these these governments became fairly convinced. Uh, that uh, that isolation and coercion uh, were not working. Um, they weren't on track to dislodge Assad. Um, he and his re his regime seem like they're there to stay, uh, even if uh, the regime is weaker, right? And uh, uh, conditions inside Syria are increasingly uh, uh, unpleasant. Um, Isolation was not achieving any sort of uh, useful behavior change uh, by the regime. Uh, and it was not somehow uh, holding Assad and the people around him uh, accountable, right? Although I don't think that was probably a, uh, a major priority for, uh, for these countries as it is for others. Um, and then I think that, uh, I think they recognized correctly that uh, they can't quarantine Syria, right? They can't isolate it. It's too pivotal uh, geographically and politically in the region to just be uh, totally cut off. Uh, and so I think that they, uh, they believed it was worth trying um, instead, uh, you know, maybe persuasion, some material inducement uh, to, uh, you know, to attempt to... Uh, to achieve positive change in Syria. Uh, now for the West, right, which is the, the target of my argument here, I think that it's not worth trying to strong arm US and Western Arab partners into reversing themselves on this. Uh, I mean, with some, we just can't, right? I mean, especially uh, Saudi Arabia, the UAE, they, they kind of, they do what they want. Uh, but anyways, I think that a move like this was bound to happen sooner or later. It just happened that the catalyst for it was uh, February's earthquake that hit uh, North Syria and southern Turkey. Um, to be clear, I'm not suggesting that the U.S. and the West themselves normalize relations with Damascus. What I think makes sense is that... Uh, that these countries work with 
their Arab partners and then see what uh, these Arab countries' new engagement with Damascus can accomplish for uh, those partners' interests and then for the Syrian public. <clears throat> um, and I think so. this might come to nothing, right? Maybe nothing will come out of this. Mm -hmm. um, but the upside in the, uh, you know, in the, uh, uh, the title of my foreign affairs piece, I'm talking about upside potential, right? I think that there's a lot of, there's good that could come out of this. Uh, there's good things, for example, in the uh, Amman communique uh, that uh, uh, a number of uh, Arab countries and uh, uh, Syria agreed in May. Uh, and which has uh, has since been the uh, the basis for their continued engagement, uh, including their uh, the August fifteenth meeting of the uh, the Arab Contact Group on Syria, uh, and I think that you know it it seems uh, worthwhile trying to hold Syria and uh, you know to these commitments and these agreed steps, mm -hmm. um, and to date. You know, I think that, I mean, Damascus has uh, offered up at least some uh, apparent good faith gestures, right? So if I think if the U.S. and others manage to work effectively uh, with, uh, uh, with our Arab partners, then, you know, in theory, we could have a conjoined, a coherent diplomatic effort that has... Uh, uh, that can muster uh, an Arab carrot instead of just a uh, a Western stick. Mm. So interesting. All right, Sam. There's a lot to uh, unpack there. I'm going to uh, reach out to uh, each of our other uh, panelists and ask them to um, sort of go at this um, from different perspectives, and we'll radiate back and forth because there, there are a number of arguments that we should uh, tease out a little bit. But uh, Mona, let me start with you. Um, could you speak a little bit about the humanitarian situation in Syria today and what you see at stake from the humanitarian situation in the whole debate Sam is talking about of normalizing uh, or not normalizing um, from, from the Arab countries? And anything else that you'd like to tackle in, in um, what he opened his remarks with? Thanks so much, Bill. And, and thanks to the Arab Gulf States Institute for hosting, I think, a very important conversation. So you opened, Bill, with some, a laydown of where we are in Syria, and you offered already some pretty grim statistics. Mm -hmm. um, I would add a few to those in order to underscore that we really can't, one can't overestimate just how dire the humanitarian situation in Syria is. Mm -hmm. After 12 years of conflict, the humanitarian situation is actually at the worst it's been since the, since the, on, the onset of, of hostilities. 70% um, of Syrians are in need of humanitarian assistance. Um, 12 million Syrians are food insecure. Um, the earthquake that we've referenced only compounded, exacerbated these difficulties. And if we look at Idlib, which I think is an area we need to focus on with, uh, this is the Northwest, a government in Syria that is not under regime control. Um, 4.5 million Syrians living there, uh, large numbers of internally displaced, many of them displaced multiple times. I raise that because it underscores the vulnerability of that population. And then that part of Syria experienced some of the worst effects of the February earthquake. So in Northwest Syria, in Idlib, more than 90% of Syrians are in need of humanitarian assistance. Um, and so this is very relevant to the discussion because I think Sam sort of alluded to it without going into it. What is normalization brought with respect to improved humanitarian access, improved deliveries of humanitarian assistance? Unfortunately, not much, uh, if anything. And in fact, arguably the situation is worse uh, than it was prior to the veto of the UN Security Council resolution 
by Russia uh, in, in July that allowed for the UN to provide cross-border assistance. I won't go into all the details and the nitty gritty on that. And it is a very complex situation. Don't get me wrong. Mm. But I think, you know, the, the May communique that Sam referenced gave lip service to the importance of humanitarian access, but nothing really has been done. Um, uh, and in fact, you know, Damascus, when it initially agreed uh, to give consent to use the Bab al-Hawa crossing, um, it uh, it imposed conditions that the UN found to be, frankly, untenable. Damascus has walked that back a bit, but there are deep, deep concerns on the ground uh, by implementers. And I think Doreen will probably be able to speak to this even, even more closely than I. Um, that leads to, that has led to essentially um, a, a virtual, a, a tremendous slowdown, let's say that, in terms of humanitarian assistance crossing into Syria. Um, the other point I'd want to make, and I think we're going to we're going to circle to this, I'm going to guess, Bill, multiple times in mm -hmm. this discussion, is the issue of leverage and sequencing. So readmitting Syria to the Arab League, an enormous carrot, an enormous uh, benefit that was basically handed to Assad with no concessions on his part, uh, with no follow through. So I, I would argue that the policy of normalization has been utterly without a strategy and, and has not followed the golden rule of diplomacy, which is to recognize and covet your leverage and insist on uh, uh, the kinds of shifts and changes in behavior that are sustainable and measurable um, in advance of any concessions being, being given. Assad has proven himself not only to be a brutal dictator, but also a shrewd one, hmm. and has shown in the past an ability to pocket concessions, to seize the advantage. Uh, and in this instance, that's exactly what has happened. And you know, in this case, we could, well, I'm sure we're going to get into it, but I think there's a there's a lot more that could have, and I would argue should have been done. Understanding and acknowledging Sam's analysis that the region has said isolation isn't working, and the region has signaled for quite some time um, its fatigue with a policy of isolation. But that should have been the beginning of a much deeper engagement and a much deeper. Um, bit of, quite frankly, diplomacy and uh, deep, deep engagement of teeing up what the asks should have been, uh, assessing where the leverage lies, tagging and, and tying asks to leverage, and only with a concerted um, strategic plan should there have been any effort toward normalization that may not have been successful. Uh, but at least that would have, I think, given much more, um, much more than lip service, which is unfortunately, I think, all that we've seen. That was that is that would really have responded to the kinds of changes that the Syrian people, I think, are looking for. Thank you, Mona. Um, Doreen, um, also a follow up question. Um, as we sort of tease out some of these points that uh, Sam has has made. Um, and Mona has taken issue with some of the um, his uh, his argument. We're going to come back to it in a, a number of different ways. But I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how um, Arab normalization uh, might or might not affect the issue of accountability, the need to hold Assad and his regime accountable for their crimes. And of course, anything else you'd like to say in uh, opening uh, response to, to Sam. Great. Thank you so much, Ambassador Robert. Thank you for, for having me here. Mm. It is incre an incredibly important topic. Um, and I do want to make a few points on, on normalization in, in general before talking about the accountability bit. And this is not a critique of Sam's logic or, or um, piece. But generally speaking, advocates of normalization often either overlook and or conflate a number of things here. One, they tend to be more Catholic than the Pope. Um, Arab countries themselves are not arguing that this is going to work and that Assad will come through on all or any of their asks. They're merely saying, as Mona pointed out, that the alternative hasn't been working. 
in absent meaningful Western engagement, they're they're just ready to try something different, to try a different approach. It can't hurt, at least it can't hurt them. But I haven't heard any optimism from Arab capitals that this is gonna yield any significant results. Also, advocates of normalization often tend to draw a connection between Assad's isolation and the regime doubling down on its brutality. The reality is the regime relied on excessive violence, not because of regional or international pressure, but despite of it. Assad took a very brutal approach against his opponents while Arab countries were engaging with it and while they were negotiating. As a matter of fact, while Arab uh, the observers were in Damascus, uh, they took a very different approach after Arab countries cut their relations with it. I reckon they're going to continue to do so now that Arab countries have restored their ties with it. So I don't think relations with Arab countries factors really into the calculation of how Damascus acts or behaves. And I don't necessarily see how or why that's going to change. Um, also, an important point is that those advocating for normalization often tend to inflate the significance of the role of Arab countries in Syria. I mean, yes, early on in the conflict, major Gulf countries invested in the opposition, but since 2015, that has received a significant rate. Um, and their influence really has diminished. I mean, obviously, vis-a-vis -vis, like other major actors like Iran and Russia. Um, and I don't think Arab countries are willing to invest significantly enough to match out what Iran is offering. So, I mean, I think that's kind of a wishful thinking argument to say that they're going to balance out Iranian influence, and we can speak more about that. But just like a final point on, on that is that they also tend to conflate uh, restoration of diplomatic relations with a comprehensive rehabilitation strategy. This, I mean, the latter would entail significant investment to bail out Damascus. And I'm not a Gulf analyst, but my understanding is that big Gulf states know quite well that investing large amounts in Syria with its devastated infrastructure and its predatory regime and dismal security and nominal control over, over parts of Syria would be really like pouring money into a bottomless pit. Mm -hmm. And and many of these countries really wanted to restore diplomatic ties with Damascus to avoid regional headaches, not to add on to their plates. Um, but a quick note on the accountability bit, and, and, and I promise I'll stop here. But, you know, Assad is not just one other Middle Eastern dictator. The magnitude of the crimes committed by this regime are just unmatched in the region's modern history. And that is really telling for a region that is almost exclusively run by autocratic regimes. So it's one thing for the world to sit by while half a million Syrians get killed. And it's a totally different thing for the international community to meet and greet the perpetrators. But again, we need to make a distinction between autocratic governments doing that and the rest of the world following suit. Um, and I understand why Arab countries would do that. I get their logic. Uh, I don't think it's going to go anywhere, but I, I get it. Um, but I'm not sure why others would follow suit. So, I mean, of course, if it does happen that the world accepts Assad, it will have massive ramifications um, on the erosion of norms and the future of the region. But I do think it's premature to speak about a rehabilitated Assad that is just, that, you know, evades all accountability. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, Jim, uh, you're a, you've been a very senior statesman for the U.S. government. Um, we've worked together on Syria for a number of years. Um, I'm very interested in hearing from you about where you think Sam got things right, where you, where you think he got things wrong, um, whether on the issue of, of uh, Iran. He hasn't talked about Iranian influence in, in, in his remarks today, but he mentioned it in, in his article, um, particularly interested in that subject. But anything you'd like to say in your opening? Thanks for having me on, Bill, and good to see you all. Uh, Sam has a point. I'm going to leave aside two critical things that I hope to get back to as I address the specifics of Sam's argument. Those are the geostrategic realities in which Doreen uh, uh, gave a good uh, summary. I would add a few things to make uh, her prediction that we shouldn't uh, uh, let this uh, go unchallenged, uh, even more dire than uh, she painted it. And secondly, the role of the U.S. with one minor thing, although, as I said, both of these things are critically important to any larger assessment of Syria. But for now, we've got uh, uh, Sam and the Arab Initiative. 
Uh, first of all, Sam is right that the Arabs concluded, and they concluded correctly, that uh, Assyria was two things. First of all, it was a um, generator of security threats of various kinds to the region. Uh, he mentioned some of them, uh, the uh, six million refugees, half the population destabilizing neighboring countries, uh, the uh, Captagon uh, drug crisis, uh, three terrorist, or depending upon who you are, uh, terrorist groups that are pretty powerful, uh, Hayatur al-Sham, uh, obviously ISIS, and the PKK offshoot that are also our allies, complicating things, uh, floating around as major military forces that nobody can defeat so far. Uh, and uh, uh, there are some that are in the article, as you mentioned, Bill, but they're also important. Uh, Turkey's overall security concerns, Israel's security concerns with Iran, uh, the accountability that uh, Doreen mentioned, uh, particularly on chemical weapons and a few other things. So there's all of these things that mean they need to be fixed. Secondly, the isolation strategy wasn't fixing them. As one of the um, uh, many authors of that isolation strategy, or at least the U.S. component of it, I uh, willingly concede to that. All the isolation strategy was doing was managing and containing some of the out, some of the offshoots of these various uh, security problems that Syria was generating. The whole idea of uh, John Kerry and the uh, Obama administration, the Trump administration, when you and I were doing this bill, uh, and the Arabs is to work a trade. Uh, the isolation of Syria, which goes far more than diplomatic, it's the sanctions, it's the lack of economic flows, it's the military presence of three outside armies, uh, uh, the Israeli, the Turkish, and the American, and on and on. Uh, eliminate that step by step in return for Syria fixing these security threats emanating from Syria, and most of them emanating from the decisions of the Assad government against the region. So the concept is not wrong. It's the concept we followed, Bill, step by step. The Arabs call it, at least some of them call it step plus step, but much of it, and there've been some releases of uh, the details that began with uh, King uh, Abdullah of Jordan's uh, initiative with both Washington, and then he went to talk to Putin in uh, Moscow back two years ago. Uh, the idea is, as Mona said, uh, the uh, Arab states lead with making concessions in return for Assad, step-by-step, uh, step, reducing these security threats by changing his behavior. It was never designed, not by Kerry, I'm pretty <laughs> sure, certainly not by the uh, Trump administration to overthrow Assad, it was get him to change uh, his behavior on these things that are of concern to the outside world. So it's not necessarily a bad thing because the United States, beginning uh, with the Biden administration, stopped the channel, the US-Russia channel that we were doing, Bill, uh, to try to carry this out. So it's not unreasonable for somebody to decide, why don't we try it? Uh, and that's what they're doing. Now, the problems, and uh, we've already heard several critiques of them, and I'll just add to them, is first of all, uh, the Arabs only have one major concession, one major carrot, which is the uh, uh, admission of uh, Syria back into, other, or the unfreezing of Syria's membership in the Arab League, and they've already done that. They didn't get a whole lot there. I would uh, agree more with Mona than with uh, uh, Sam. Uh, the one thing that is material, and this gets into the United States and is very complicated as Mona thought, is the uh, Bab al-Hawa. That is an important thing. But bear in mind, the Russians vetoed the first vote for a year. They agreed to six months and we turned it down. Back in 2020, Bill, we accepted that. Right. And live to do again. I don't know why the administration did that, I, but it's, I don't it doesn't increase the humanitarian uh, benefits. It simply means Assad gets credit for what the Russians were doing in the end up until that point. I think that that was a diplomatic maneuver between the Russians and the Syrians. In fact, I'm sure it was. I'm just not so sure whether there were some people in the U.S. government who were involved in it, but I'll leave that to the side. But beyond that, they haven't gotten anything and they have nowhere to go. It's not just that Assad isn't carrying uh, through in any material way on the agreements that uh, his people did sign. It's that what more can they do? The isolation of Assad continues. It's the economic strangulation of that country, mainly by Assad, but no one 
even without U.S. and European sanctions. No one's going to put money into that country right now. Uh, but there is, so there's the lack of uh, rebuilding, there's the uh, sanctions, there is the military presence of the three outside countries, there is the various uh, UN under 2254, OPCW and other international and national, think of Germany, uh, accountability campaigns against Assad. That is the bulk of the isolation of Assad. That's what the Russians were desperate in talking with us to try to get us to lift step by step. That's what they want. I don't know if Assad personally wants that, but I think the Syrian people do. But the Arabs can't deliver on that. So I don't think this is going to go anywhere. It's not necessarily an illogical thing. As I said, we were following a rather similar approach. It's just that the Arab Arabs do not have the leverage. They blew away their one, as Mona said, uh, possible concession. And it's very difficult to negotiate with a committee. It was hot as hell when we, the United States, had the lead, more or less agreed by the Europeans, the uh, Arabs, uh, the Turks, the Israelis, uh, and most of the Syrian groups. It was still hot as hell and not all that successful. Uh, good luck to the Arabs trying to uh, do this uh, as a, a cacophony of countries. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm going to come to... Uh... Doreen, as we sort of uh, follow through on this, but I wanted to give Sam a quick shot. Jam, uh, Sam, just um, you've heard uh, a number of um, approaches, responses to your arguments. We're going to tackle a lot of it all the way through, and you'll have plenty of chance to uh, to develop a response. But uh, just in terms of wave tops, any uh, observation or two you want to make at this point? Sure. Well, I mean. So just to kind of responding to Mona, I just want to say, I mean, I don't think that it's the case that, uh, you know, that uh, uh, humanitarian access uh, has actually worsened uh, since these, uh, you know, since this move towards normalization, right? I mean, because what I see is uh, you had Damascus's move uh, to unilaterally offer permission uh, for use of Baba Salama and El Rai and the northern Aleppo countryside. Uh, in the aftermath of the earthquake, the Amman communique encouraged Damascus uh, to extend that permission. Damascus did, right? The uh, Amman communique, likewise, uh, I think it uh, uh, it placed an emphasis, uh, at least rhetorically, on uh, humanitarian access, as per uh, I think the uh, you know the relevant uh, Security Council resolutions, including the latest version of the cross border resolution, uh, when uh, when Russia. Not, I mean, so not Damascus, but when Russia vetoed that, then Damascus uh, stepped in and offered its own uh, unilateral permi uh, permission for that. Uh, I mean, obviously, it uh, uh, it linked that to conditions that the UN regarded as unworkable. But then, when uh, the UN uh, engaged Damascus, made clear uh, why those were not viable, uh, then Damascus apparently backed off on those conditions. Right, and then arrived at uh, uh, at something more workable uh, simultaneously to to offering permission for uh, uh, for Babel Hawa. Um, it also uh, it offered renewed uh, uh, renewed permission for Baba Salama and El Rai. Uh, so, and then since then, uh, you know, there's something you know that that's still gumming up uh, the use of Babel Hawa. I think I uh, I don't yet have uh, have clarity on what the hang up is there. Uh, but the UN has continued to uh, to conduct cross border missions and to to deliver aid through Baba Salami, uh, you know, which was again proffered and extended uh, uh, per you know per this uh, uh, Arab engagement. Um, I think that Syria's uh, uh, permission for UN use of Baba Sal uh, Baba Hawa um, that's not a small thing, right? I think that uh, uh, I mean I think that. Uh, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey, uh, Ambassador Roebuck, uh, know this from being inside the State Department. I think they know how much of uh, U.S. diplomats' time and bandwidth it took up to, uh, to secure cross-border renewal every six months or, or 12 years, right? This was, uh, I feel like, you know, for years now, this has been among the, uh, the top focuses of attention uh, for for U.S. and other Western diplomats, 
uh, and then so for Damascus to proffer this, right? I think that's it's a real thing, right? Yeah. Um, the other point that I just wanted to make was, I mean, uh, Ambassador Jeffrey's point about the uh, uh, Arabs' leverage being spent uh, with uh, uh, Syria's kind of the uh, restoration of its participation in the Arab League. Um, I don't think that's the case, right? Because Syria needs money, right? The economy is wrecked. Uh, and I think that it needs, uh, you know, if it hopes to stabilize the economy or uh, I think uh, what was agreed in the Amman communique uh, was uh, an investment by uh, these Arab countries and uh, by the international community broadly uh, to uh, in early recovery programs and the restoration of essential services in refugees areas of return. Right, inclusive of uh, rebuilding schools and hospitals. Uh, Damascus, it needs these resources. Uh, that leverage on the part of the Arabs is renewable. Right, That's not going to go away. Uh, and I don't think that, uh, uh, that reopening communications with Assad, uh, that readmitting him to the Arab League uh, is you know, the end of the story here. Right. Mm -hmm. And anyways, I don't think that the readmission of the Arab League could have been uh, meaningfully leveraged anyways, right? I mean, just because the Syrians, whatever, you know, they're not, they're difficult, right? So I think that I'm dubious that that would have been a major point of leverage in any case, but it's not, it's not the only thing in the Arabs' hands here. Thank you, Sam. Um, Doreen, I'm going to come back to you for a second. Um, I'm interested... Um, in your uh, take on Sam's argument, it's also an argument other people make that Syria is, is just too important of a country um, in the region uh, to keep it geographically, um, to keep it isolated. It's too important in terms of geography, uh, economy, um, politics, uh, especially given that uh, the Arabs' previous efforts to arm the revolt uh, and and isolate Syria failed. Um, what is your uh, take on those arguments, or in particular the point about Syria's place in the region? And and then anything you want to say about the leverage piece that uh, people have been to Jim and, and Mona have raised with Sam? Right. Um, if it's okay with you, I would just also like to comment on the conversation around um, Damascus giving consent to use Bevel Hall border crossing because I think. This is a big uh, misrepresentation of, of a negotiation process that happened not too far long yes, ago. Yes, please do. Um, uh, I just um, warn, uh, it probably is a pretty complicated uh, topic. <laughs> so uh, have at it. But uh, with that uh, caveat that those of us who follow it recognize it's, it's pretty complicated. No, absolutely. I'm not going to go into the weeds at all. I'm just going to say that taking a step back and I find it very interesting uh, that Sam connected this to the normalization or as a concession from Damascus, because the way most of us see this is that the UN and donors handed Damascus control over an area where they had none. They gave them leverage over something they've never had. This was a gift to Damascus. And that's why they jumped on it. And I remember um, the, the, the Syrian ambassador to the UN's first initial response to this request was like, sure, we don't control it. Um, mm. And I mean, that's understood. They were given a huge leverage over, again, over an area that they never did. So portraying that as a concession that Damascus gave to Western countries, I found it to be a little bit um, misleading. But you think, that said, just to say that, just, to, just for a question there real quick, during, do you think it is, as Jim um, hinted, maybe a byproduct of misplayed U.S. diplomacy? Absolutely. Or Security not just, Council diplomacy? Yeah, not just the U.S., all donors. All donors have been completely, they've completely misplayed their cards, but they've also been played by the Russians, really. Like for many years, the Russians have been taking everyone on the right in the sense that they're offering, they're asking for gifts from Western donors in order to allow them to spend their own money on people the Russians have displaced, and the Russians and the regime have displaced. It's a very, very odd logic. And everyone's been uh, getting caught in the details of whether it's six months or 12 months or nine right. months, or what should we give Damascus in order to allow us to use our own money? It's, it's a very, as you said, it's a complicated conversation, but from a mere 
negotiation and mediation standpoint, uh, mm. it is um, it really isn't the best diplomatic maneuver Western countries could have possibly pursued. Now, to your initial question about, um, well, Sam made several points, um, some in his piece and some now about um, how Arabs boycotting Syria didn't really work. And he mentioned that it didn't work in this logic outside, but it also worked in behavioral change. Um, and then um, he also argued that normalization, I think he used the word inevitable, um, or, uh, along these lines. And, you know, because Syria is so too important geographically or pivotal geographically uh, that the Arab countries couldn't keep it isolated. And there's so much to dissect here. Um, well, first of all, isolation didn't work. Didn't work to achieve what? Uh, I'm not sure anyone argued that if Assad is kicked out of the Arab League, that all of a sudden it's going to stop using excessive force to crush its opponents. Um, again, the crimes being committed were so horrendous and egregious that and Assad was so blatantly making a mockery out of the Arab League at the time and out of Arab, Arab League observers that were in Syria and witnessed firsthand, like they couldn't put a halt on these violations for the time being, like just for the days the observers were there, that it, it made it very hard for countries at the time to not take a step uh, on it. Um, but again, I don't think any Arab country or Arab capital thought that if they kicked Assad out of the Arab League, that this is going to lead to either regime change or behavioral change for that matter. Now, uh, the bit on the inevitability argument, and I think this is a major analytical shortcoming um, on Syria that it's it's been, folks have been arguing the inevitability of events since the beginning of the conflict. Assad will inevitably fall, the regime will inevitably crash. Um, and then they went to the other end of the spectrum where Assad will inevitably take back every inch of Syria and will be fully rehabilitated and the world has to accept that and it will stay in power to for the end of times. But we really need to be a bit humble in our analysis. And, and Ambassador Obak, you've mentioned uh, the scene in Syria today. If you look at the situation in, in Sweda, if you look at Dar es Idlib, Mendej, everything's been happening. Like the war has been taking such unpredictable turns in every direction. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I, I do think we haven't seen the final chapter of this very bloody, bloody episode. So I would be very cautious with the over certainty of how things are going to unfold. And I'll also be very cautious of trying to predict an upward or linear trajectory of this era of normalization. Now, um, in terms of Syria being important, I think Ambassador Jeffrey and Mona pointed out to the point of the specifics the Arab countries want from um, Assad. This includes things on um, narcotics, drug trafficking, refugees, um, dealing with jihadists, and so on and so forth, probably containing Iranian influence. But you know what? Frankly speaking, none of these issues are top national security concerns for the Gulf countries that led the normalization process. Combined, they were important enough for them to to rethink their policy, uh, especially in absence of any Western uh, clear strategy or leadership on the matter. But again, as I mentioned, I don't think Assad will deliver on any of these things. I don't think Arab countries are necessarily optimistic that Assad is going to deliver on these things. So I, again, as I said, uh, I would be overly, I would be a bit um, cautious in trying to um, predict how this is going to unfold. Um, yeah, and, 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 and Ambassador Jeffrey is absolutely right. Negotiating with a committee is, is hard. It's proven very hard so far. The committee that was created to, um, to follow up on the communiques have yielded nothing. People I talked to expected to continue to yield nothing. No one seems to be particularly bothered about it because, again, everyone knows how Damascus operates. And um, so, yeah, no one's holding their breath on it. Darren, just a quick um, follow up and just uh, take a, a minute just to give me a, your quick sense of it. You mentioned the, 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 the reasons that the Arab governments or some of them that they, they took this action. And you say they don't amount to national security considerations. Just in, sh in a, a short word, why do you think the Arab countries did this? If it wasn't for the specific interest you mentioned, drugs, refugees, jihadist flows. I mean, again, I think combined, they amount up to something that would warrant a rethink of a policy. Mm. Okay. Right? Especially the Arab states don't really have a lot at stake in Syria. Mm. Unlike other countries like Iran or Turkey, um, like they are 
they're open to trial and error because the cost of trial and error doesn't necessarily is not necessarily that high on them. So I, I think that's the logic here. Like we've tried following Western policies, it didn't lead to something, we'll try something different. Maybe it would lead to something, probably not. But you know what? At the end of the day, the cost is not very high for Arab capitals. Mm. So it makes logical sense for them to try different things. Thank you. Um, Mona, um, just open the door for you. If, you. if Is there anything in what we've discussed that you want to follow up on in terms of um, motivations of Arab countries and what they might achieve out of this policy? Um, or the just assessing the whole um, effort to isolate the regime over years um, and whether, whether or not it, it was effective and, and would two or, two or three more years of it um, have a chance of making it more effective? While Syrian lives, of course, in the country uh, are not getting any better, uh, the, the misery there is deepening, as you pointed out. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I do. I just I do want to follow up a bit on 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 Sam's response to my initial point, because I, I think it's important. There there is some nuance here that I'd like to to sort of um, lift up. One is I think we can't underestimate, as Doreen has indicated, and, and Ambassador Jeffrey, the complexity of the dynamics driving the UN border crossings and, and frankly, humanitarian access um, writ large. And I hear I would add just one more factor without taking our panel too far astray, which is I think also a miscalculation or a lack of understanding of, the, of where Russian Turkish relations were at the time. And an, an understanding at least at, at that time that Russia would not veto in order not to upset its ties with Turkey. Well, there clearly were some tensions in the bilateral relation at that time, which may have also fed into the Russian decision to veto. What I'd say to Sam, though, is, um, and I'm certainly familiar with the complexities of it, having served at USAID for a good chunk of time, when this border crossing has been, and the others, essential uh, to the delivery of humanitarian assistance. And that is, the way in which Damascus immediately imposed conditions on uh, consent for Bab al-Hawa crossing to be used really, I, I think, revealed quite a bit about its role. Damascus is not um, a credible actor. It certainly doesn't play the role that the UN has played in governing uh, cross-border assistance and the impartiality of that assistance. Um, it was clear that Damascus had uh, its own intent to essentially control how that assistance was delivered. And we know from uh, the, the practice of the regime in, in areas that it controls that it does indeed direct assistance and divert assistance, et cetera. So it's mm -hmm. not an impartial player in this. And mm -hmm. while it has walked back from those conditions, there's no trust on the ground. And I think that has to be understood where humanitarian implementers on the ground are reluctant to engage. Um, and so as I understand it, Bab al-Hawa, which was responsible for some 85% of humanitarian assistance, is, is now, it's now still at a trickle. And so that, that's really what I was referencing, is um, I think we have to dig a little bit below um, the sort of the action itself. To understand better the complexities of how Damascus is viewed and, and the role that Syria has played with regard to the provision of humanitarian aid, which is not a good one. Um, I mean, I don't want to repeat all that's been said. I, I think, Bill, on this broader question, again, I my sense is there's no disagreement on the panel about uh, the desire, the, the, the sense by Arab actors that isolation simply wasn't working. Mm. Um, I think that's clear. I think the issue really is how that, you know, that was understood. And, and frankly, that was telegraphed a few years ago. Um, to me, the issue is why it was that, frankly, I think the U.S. in a way should have gotten ahead of the curve on this, understood better um, where the trends were pointing. And here, I just disagree with Sam. I, I don't think that, that, that leverage has been well utilized. Uh, and, and as a result, I think that's why we are where we are, um, mm -hmm. particularly since we see that Assad has shown himself capable of pocketing concessions and not giving much 
right? Um, if anything, so th that's the issue. And the only other thing I'll I'll point to, I think, uh, Bill is, and I think it was an interesting, some interesting points that Doreen laid out with regard to kind of where the region is. I do think we can situate the the, the normalization with Assad in a broader context of pretty sweeping transformations that are going on across the region, where I think the, that we clearly see um, uh, a fatigue with conflict. We see a desire for de-escalation. We see rapprochement happening in all kinds of places, whether between Saudi Arabia and Iran. There's lots of discussion in the news today about a potential deal between Saudi and Israel. Who knows if that will happen? But regardless, I think it speaks to a very significant shift in the region. And here I think it is important, and this is, I think, a point for, for, an, for American audience and for our government, to really shift and pivot its posture with respect to the region. Um, and, and frankly, in my view, deepen our uh, diplomatic game and efforts, uh, invest far more into um, diplomatic capital, and develop, frankly, soft power tools and others. Those are the kinds of tools that are gonna be needed in this new multipolar Middle East of which the normalization of, of Arab countries with, with Assad is just one example of many, many shifts and dynamics that I think are um, emerging and, and yet to fully play out. And I think the US really, we should not squander the opportunity to play an important role in, shift, in, in shaping uh, those trends and tendencies in a way that that's consonant, quite frankly, with U.S. national security interests. Thank you, Mona. Uh, Jim, quick question. So Sam, in his piece, doesn't argue that the U.S. and Europe um, should follow suit and normalize with the regime. Uh, he just advocates that the Biden administration, as I understand his argument, should work with our, our Arab partner countries who have done this on shared interest in Syria. And you've talked about this a little bit in some of the, the shared uh, concerns, drugs, Iranian influence, release of Syrian detainees, and improving the lives of ordinary Syrians. Do you think that this effort can work? Can the Arab countries get something from Assad? And how does U.S. policy uh, mesh with that effort? Does it does that effort does that policy undercut our efforts, or can they work together? They can, but it's complicated. And so I'll have to pull in those things I said I would leave uh, for the moment uh, uh, 50 minutes ago, which is uh, a little bit uh, bigger look at the U.S. policy. Uh, and I'll start with the, quote, failure of uh, isolation. Isolation uh, is misunderstood. It is not failed. This is like saying that uh, the um, armistice in Korea failed because we didn't achieve the unification of the, the uh uh, country and uh, peace in Korea, but we did achieve, uh, we avoided some bad things. Uh, it's the same thing with the isolation strategy. There are three essential outcomes of the Syrian situation of this complicated 12 year conflict. One is uh, Assad wins, but not just Assad, Russia and Iran win in a place, as Sam has correctly uh, underlined, is strategic and central in the Middle East. That introduces a whole new strategic dynamic to the region uh, in the context of great power competition post uh, the invasion of Ukraine. If you want to see what the Middle East will look at, look at the successful uh, Russian uh, exploitation of US and particularly French blunders in the Sahel over the last four years and how the whole strategic order there has changed, not only for the worst for US and European interests, but I would say from the standpoint of the people there, because increasingly all we're dealing with is an expanding uh, ISIS and expanding Wagner mercenary presence and expanding refugees and humanitarian disaster. That's what a victory for Assad and friends means in the region. That's the first option. The second option is uh, worked by from, again, uh, carry on forward, now the Arabs have the helm, uh, a step-by-step -step, uh, release of isolating Assad in return for Assad fixing the security things that are emanating or threatened to emanate from Syria. And we've already talked about this in some detail. I won't go into it. That's the second option. The mm -hmm. third option is 
the isolation strategy that was deliberate, although much of it came together serendipity, but certainly after I took over the helm uh, with Mike Pompeo, it was deliberate strategy to do two things. The first didn't succeed, which was to provide the incentive to get the Russians and Assad to make these compromises and go down the path of a step-by-step resolution. That's where we're back to with the Arabs. But the second purpose of the isolation was until such time as maybe it would be opportune to resolve this thing, a final solution, if you will, to prevent a strategic win for Assad and his evil friends, Iran and uh, Russia. And in that sense, the isolation is continuing. To go back to the administration, they came in and they took two obvious and one possibly not obvious step. One is they decided they would not talk with the Russians. They ended those contacts. There was some behind the scenes, but they didn't go very far and they weren't very formal and they didn't weren't shared with everybody. And then that totally shut down with Ukraine. Secondly, uh, they reduced the whole Syrian problem to humanitarian and ISIS. Thirdly, which those two were explicit. The third one may or may not have been a feeling that somehow we could work with Assad. There were indications of that. There's a foreign affairs piece from 2019 that talks about this uh, that I think influenced some people in the administration. Uh, The problem is that A, this was not a smart policy in my mind. It reduced US influence as I think uh, uh, Doreen and Mona have both alluded to. But more importantly, it collided with the Ukraine situation. So that Mm -hmm. now the administration, when you ask about what's important, pressed, they will, and even not pressed, they will talk about maintaining the ceasefires, keeping the U.S. troops on, fighting ISIS. Uh, They're sotto voce, but believe me, they're doing it, uh, supporting Israeli operations uh, indirectly through the ceasefire, supporting the Turkish presence, uh, maintaining the uh, delicate balance with the Turks and the SDF uh, more or less successfully, uh, humanitarian issues, and generally, but with faint of heart in terms of the administration, continuing the sanctions because Congress wants. Those are all of the things we were doing, basically. It just doesn't have a head, but all of the arms and legs are still moving. Absent that head, the Arabs have moved in, but without coordinating with us and the Europeans and the UN in places like the OPCW, the owners of all of the continuing isolation elements on a side, it's not going to get very far, and none of those are going to yield, I don't think, uh, if Assad doesn't move. Thank you, Jim. Um, I'm going to come back to um, what you were talking about with the the great power aspects of the um, the whole conflict, um, and I want to um, give other panelists a chance maybe to uh, weigh in on that, and uh, in particular on uh, how the role of um, or the predicament of Syrian people uh, and their current conditions, the humanitarian humanitarian catastrophe, play into this great power uh, competition. Um, Doreen, any uh, comment you want to make on that, or Mona, either one? I'll, I'll jump in, and then I'd love to hear Doreen's thoughts. Uh, okay. I mean, I think. Look, I think it's, as Ambassador Jeffrey has pointed out, there was a period in which it was possible for the U.S. and Russia to cooperate on issues related to Syria, particularly humanitarian issues, where the U.S. and Russia both sat on humanitarian task force um, that was um, convened and held in Geneva. Ukraine has wiped that possibility uh, off the uh, off the table. And unfortunately, what, what concerns me with in that regard is that we actually are seeing Syria become an arena of spillover tension from Ukraine, mm-hmm. uh, where we're seeing uh, the Russians take increasingly provocative action against U.S. forces in the region. And then, of course, the U.S. responding in kind uh, by uh, upping our air power uh, with F-35s now uh, sent to or F-22s, what, whichever kind, but basically upping our air power um, and our posture, all of which I think comes at the expense of, uh, again, the, the ability to focus and think about where and how to cooperate. And, and again, I think the UN crossing is another example um, 
another another victim uh, of that lack of cooperation, where there was, I think, an implicit, if not explicit, shared uh, interest in in assuaging the humanitarian situation on the ground. So I think as as tensions rise between the U.S. and Russia as a result of Ukraine and the possibility for cooperation, whatever little there had been goes away. Unfortunately, I do think that will have adverse impacts um, in terms of the humanitarian situation on the ground for Syrians. Thank you, Mona. Um, Doreen, we have a question from the audience. I wonder if I could throw your way and um, uh, see what you have to say about it. And um, also feel free to weigh in. And then we'll come back to Sam and give him a chance to comment on some of the things that have been said. So um, the question from the audience uh, asks about uh, what's going on, in, for example, the protests in the South um, and how might these protests, this is from uh, Alex Langlois, if I could use his name. He says, how might these protests uh, be used um, or function to strengthen Arab state leverage in, in the, these countries' step-by-step uh, -step approach. Um, any, um, any sense about how developments inside Syria might strengthen this uh, Arab normalization approach or, um, as you've hinted in your, uh, your remarks, undermine it? I think these demonstrations, as well as other events we've mentioned throughout the call in the Azor and the North, um, everything really happening in various parts of Syria, I think is going to bring home what we've been trying, the points we're trying to make here in Arab capitals, that Damascus might not be the solution to a lot of the problems they have been trying to address. So, mm. yes, these capitals have been concerned about this disintegration of the state, but they're also, they were concerned about refugees, more unrest, uh, more Syrians leaving the country, jihadists you know, roaming around Syria, drug trade. And the fact that 12 years into it, that people today are still calling for regime change, despite the unmatched levels of violence that we used against demonstrators and, and oppositions in Syria, is indicative that this is not the end of it. The, the argument that Assad won and it's over, and if we just talk to the one guy in Damascus, we can sort out all our concerns in Syria, really is, um, I mean, it's always been an analytically questionable argument, but I think the timing of these demonstrations showcase that, you know, the problems are bigger, deeper, and it is hard to envision a scenario in which Assad is going to be uh, center to solving some of these problems. Um, Sam, I'm going to come to you in just one second. I want to ask, if I could, Doreen, just wedge in a quick question about um, Turkey. So we've got a lot of Arab normalization. What are the prospects for Turkey uh, to normalize and what are what might its interests be? There are some discussions that have gone on um, periodically. What's your assessment? That's a really good question because Turkey is really the big elephant in the room here. It's a country with a lot of stake in Syria. Um, it, today, Turkey has around 10,000 troops on the ground. It controls four enclaves across northern Syria. It backs thousands of rebels. Um, it constantly threatens to uh, invade parts of northern Syria. Um, so it is really a major actor in Syria today. So if any potential mobilization of Damascus will have significant ramifications on the ground. Now, um, in terms, I, I really hate to predict, but it doesn't seem from um, looking at both actions and discourse when it comes to Ankara-Damascus relations. Recently, it doesn't seem to be headed in a direction that could amount to an actual normalization that looks anything like what Arab countries are doing. And again, that is mainly because Turkey has a lot at stake. Um, Turkey wants two things from Damascus. It wants it to crush the Kurdish-led Syrian Democratic Forces, restore its control over northeastern Syria, minus any Iranian influence, and it wants it to not send more waves of refugees its way coming from the Northwest. Two things that Damascus is completely unable to deliver on. And I think um, officials you talk to in Ankara who are leading the Syrian file would say, we've been talking to them about this for years. Um, talking doesn't mean any action. And I think there are 
pretty much convinced that Damascus is unable to deliver on any of that. Now, what Damascus wants of Turkey is a full withdrawal of Syria. If you're sitting in Damascus and you look at northern Syria, Turkey is occupying the majority of it. Uh, and it makes a lot of sense for them to say we want to reinstate our sovereignty and we want the occupying force out. But again, that's going to come at a grave cost for Turkey because, uh, as one Turkish official put it, every kilometer we leave for Damascus, we get 100,000 refugees coming our way, escaping and fleeing the violent takeover. Um, so the bottom lines between Damascus and Ankara remain really high. I don't see that changing. Uh, especially as long as Erdogan is in power and the AKP is in power. But frankly speaking, even if there's a different coalition in Ankara, I don't necessarily think they're going to be able to find an agreement with Damascus that would satisfy their national security interests. Thank you. Thank you, Doreen. Um, Sam, I'm going to come to you now. Jim, I'll come back to you and if, uh, see if you have anything you want to add on the Turkey issue uh, after I've uh, gone to Sam. Uh, Sam, uh, a lot of comments uh, over the past, past few minutes. Um, anything you want to pick up and uh, develop? Yeah, I mean, so I wanted to, to key into something that Tareen had said. Um, you know, mainly that, uh, you know, that nobody in these uh, Arab capitals uh, is that bothered uh, about this course of normalization uh, because these countries don't have a lot at stake in Syria and thus, the cost for them of of trial and error is uh, is lower. Mm. Um, and I think this is true, right? I mean, and this is this is the kind of the other side of the argument that I tried to advance in the foreign affairs article, right? Which is that uh, I think I see, you know, maybe uh, incorrectly, uh, some real upside potential uh, for uh, Arab engagement with Damascus. Uh, whereas on the other hand, I think that the downside potential, the real risk here, I think is pretty limited, right? I think that what uh, a lot of people seem to be most concerned about uh, or to be warning about as, you know, as likely uh, kind of outcomes of uh, Syria's return to the Arab League, Arab normalization, um, I think a lot of this relates uh, much more to Syrian Turkish normalization. Um, so for example, uh, the destabilization, the destabilization of the front lines in Northwest and Northeast Syria, uh, some new, uh, uh Syrian military action, uh, against Idlib. Uh, I mean, these are, these are things that would, uh, that would come out of, uh, oh, and then, you know, potentially, uh, some sort of like a, a, a U.S. exit from Northeast Syria. These are things that are related, uh, much more to uh, Syrian Turkish normalization, right? Which, uh, as as Darin said, does not seem to be uh, advancing uh, currently. Um, whereas, you know, I think that uh, with uh, uh, with a lot of these Arab countries, I think that you know that the the real dangers of them reaching out to Damascus uh, are minimal right even if the scenes you know these scenes of uh uh of Assad visiting uh Abu Dhabi and Dubai uh of you know going to to Jeddah for the uh the Arab League summit even if those are uh kind of shocking uh, and upsetting for people um I think that like the the real human consequences uh are not that much right and then with which again, I think kind of militates in favor of a position by the U.S. and by others of, you know, seeing where this goes, right? Or like what uh, what good results can be uh, worked out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, Jim, I wanted to come to you and see if you uh, wanted to comment on the prospects for um, Turkey uh, normalizing or just... Uh, Turkey's influence in general uh, on the Syria conflict. Um, and I wanted to throw in a question from the audience, uh, basically saying that the Assad regime has it has built itself over the last decades to withstand isolation and, and pressure. Um, so does it make sense to continue such a strategy? But let's start with Turkey. Sure. Although it's all linked together. Uh, I agree with Dareen. Uh, I don't think there's very much in this. And I think the reason is that uh, 
in contrast to the baby steps on humanitarian uh, access, which are obviously even among us somewhat controversial, and the uh, not unimportant, but still diplomatic gesture of the Arab League, uh, we're now getting into real things. The U.S. position in Al-Tam, which as we all know, although we don't say it has nothing to do with fighting ISIS, but we have troops there under fire at times. Uh, the Israeli uh, operations that have been closing down airports uh, recently uh, all over uh, Syria and on and on and on. These reflect realities. Uh, the Arab initiative, with one exception, Jordan does have real security interests at stake. From the Captagon to its borders, uh, they don't want the Iranians on their uh, southern border, and they have them. Uh, they are concerned about ISIS and on and on. Um, it is largely the Arabs trying something new. And I would say, uh, I would argue that, and I could be very wrong here, um, this characterizes most of these supposedly fundamental transcendental changes in the Middle East that we are supposedly seeing. I dispute that. I was present for a true trans two transcendental changes, 1972, 73 in Southeast Asia when China flipped in 1989 in Germany. But it turns out to some degree now looking back over 40 years, they were less transcendental uh, and transformation than we thought, but they certainly were significant. I see nothing like this. What I see is uh, a U.S. security order that over four administrations has led the beneficiaries of it to question whether we're serious on dealing with the primary threat they all see, which is Iranian expansion and a variety of secondary ones, uh, Islamic, uh, Sunni Islamic uh, terrorist movements, uh, Russia, particularly in Syria, but uh, to some degree recently in Libya, uh, and uh, the never-ending, uh, uh, at least, uh, inherent problem of Israel relations with the Palestinians. And as we have uh, pivoted, as we say, and shown less attention, people are nervous, so they're doing all of these things. But fundamentally, nobody has given up. China stopped trying to expand in 1972 throughout the region. I was there. Iran has not taken this decision. Russia is more aggressive and more interested now in upending the U.S. order in the Middle East because it sees a chance than it was before. Uh, Islamic terrorist groups, as you know better than anyone, Bill, are uh, basically being contained now, but they remain somewhat of a threat. Uh, but the main difference is that the United States is not playing a major role. Now, you talk to these guys and they're right. They say, hey, Compare us to any of the guys who've come before us. We've gone almost three years now, and we haven't had a major crisis in the Middle East other than the way we withdrew from Afghanistan. But as we all know, that's kind of peripheral to the region. So give us our due. And I, do, and I, and I have to. Uh, you know, uh, hats off, because that's the biggest thing is to do nothing stupid. But in the process, what they've done is they've raised questions about our reliability. That has implications for what's going on in the Middle East and has implications beyond that. And that's another reason why I wish, as uh, everybody else has been saying, the U.S. would engage more through the Arabs. That's fine. Or indirectly uh, through the Russians, uh, whatever, uh, to uh, play a bigger role in Syria, but also in the region as a whole. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Mona, could I come back to you? Uh, we have a question from the audience asking about um, the Syrian economy and um, the impact it could have uh, on overall uh, human humanitarian situation and, and essentially political control. How They're basically asking how bad could it get? Could it reach the point of uh, anarchy or uh, loss of state control? J could you just talk about the economy question and where you think that uh, could be going? Sure. I, if I could, I want to make one point, though, before um, about refugees, because yep. I think that's a piece that we, we haven't really focused on enough. Um, and, and here I think there is a real danger, particularly emanating from from Lebanon, um, where normalization becomes a fig leaf uh, for forced return. And while there are there's, again, lots of lip service um, that, um, you know, returns have to be you know, you know, dignified, voluntary, and safe. 
Um, it, it is concerning the extent to which a new narrative can be constructed that the conflict in Syria is over. Quite frankly, given developments over the last few weeks, that's harder to make <laughs> with the unrest in the South and, and the unrest in, in the East. But I do think, it, it, I just want to put on the table, it is worrisome um, that normalization can be used um, as an excuse for sending refugees back. Uh, perhaps not in huge numbers, but we've already seen forced deportations, both from Lebanon and Turkey. And I just think that's something that needs to be at least acknowledged and, and thought about. Um, so, look, I think that, unfortunately, I personally don't see an end to the downward spiral that the Syrian economy is taking. And therefore, by extension, the dire humanitarian impacts that, that the country is experiencing. I don't see this, though, as regime threatening. I mean, this is a regime that is a corrupt, cronyist regime that is able to maintain and, 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 and hold for itself what it needs with respect to uh, largesse and resources and so forth. I think that will continue. Um, on, but what I do think we will see, sadly, is, is the continued suffering of everyday Syrians. Um, and in an era when humanitarian uh, uh, budgets are actually shrinking and where Syria falls lower and lower on the list of priorities with so much need in the world, particularly, of course, emanating from Ukraine and elsewhere. I, I think, unfortunately, the prognosis is for uh, continued uh, deterioration of everyday living. Let's also be clear that the regime's control across uh you know, areas that it holds is 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 wavering in certain areas. It's this is not a this is not uh, a normal uh, government that has control and and over over all of the areas under its under its you know, under its territory. Um, and so I don't I don't I think that will continue. But I do not think I would underscore I do not think that the economic crisis will become one that actually threatens the regime's hold on power. Thank you, Mona. Um, we have a question from the audience. Um, I'm going to um, maybe let, um, I might toss this one to Sam and others can um, can also deal with it. The, the audience member is asking about, um, is responding to the point that a couple of people have made from different angles about um, how much actual uh, interest do the Arab countries have in Syria? Um, Sam talked about that this is a trial and error type policy, and uh, they have the ability to uh, to experiment a little bit, essentially without um, high cost on on the downside. This person is uh, basically making the opposite uh, point, saying it is um, it is um, damaging for the average states to take these uh, trial and error, this trial and error approach, because it undercuts the leverage of other countries that are trying to um, enforce a policy with regard to um, things like refugees and um, drug, all the issues that we have uh, talked about uh, that the international community is engaging with Assad. Um, Sam, how do you approach this uh, argument from the other side that actually what the Arab countries are doing is risky and um, and damaging because it undercuts the overall amount of leverage the international community has in dealing with Assad? Uh, I mean, so I don't believe that leverage is real. Mm. Um, sorry, I mean, with uh, respect to the to the questioner. Yeah. Um, I mean, uh, the kind of the analogy, maybe this is strained that uh, uh, that I've used on on leverage before, right? Is that uh, uh, for leverage you need a, a you need a lever, right? Or you need a, a what is it? You need like a, what do they call it? Like a stick, and you need a fulcrum, mm -hmm. right? Uh, the fulcrum uh, I think of as the uh, uh, the theory of change, right? That's what's going to convert your stick into leverage into something useful uh if you don't have uh, a viable theory of change if there's no fulcrum then you just have a stick that is inert right so i think that's uh you know a lot of uh notional uh leverage 
uh, that I think people can point to uh, on Damascus, if there's no plausible way to uh, to convert that into uh, a desirable outcome, then it is not really leverage, mm -hmm. right? It's not useful. Um, and so I think that, and I, you know, I think that over the past decade plus, um, we've seen that a, a more kind of uh, a tougher and more coercive uh, approach uh, towards Damascus has not uh, has not yielded uh, a lot of the results uh, that people are looking for. Um, certainly, I think that, you know, on on issues related to uh, uh, to refugees or to drugs, uh, you know, I think that uh, Arab countries, but then also some, you know, more proximate European countries now are, you know, have maybe lost patience uh, with a uh, a more inflexible and uh, sort of uh, immobile uh, approach uh, by countries that are more distant from Syria, right? That are more geographically removed and insulated from uh, some of the, 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 you know, the spillover of, uh, you know, serious conflict. Um, I mean, so, you know, I think this is a little bit outside the scope of my discussion or of my uh, my article, you know, but I mean, we think uh, uh, we've seen some, you know, posture changes from, uh, uh, for example, the Italians um, who uh, uh, who I think would say that they share a, uh, a sea border uh, with Syria in a way that uh, like the French uh, or the Dutch or the British do not. Um. So I would say that. Mm -hmm. I think also, let's see. I mean, I think on as relates to uh, to refugees, I know that some Lebanese officials have uh, have pointed to regional normalization as you know, in some ways, an excuse uh, for forced returns. I just don't think that that was really operative or, you know, especially uh, dispositive on their thinking, mm -hmm. right? I mean, the forced returns that we saw earlier this year, they were in April, they were in May, they were by the Lebanese army, uh, and they were apparently conducted, you know, in this kind of cack-handed uh, unilateral way uh, uh, by the military outside, you know, normal uh, uh, systems and procedures. Uh, and then in response to, you know, like a welling of, of anti-refugee sentiment in uh in Lebanese communities right I mean but this is something that uh seems to me uh to be a result of uh you know a function of uh Lebanon's own domestic politics uh mm -hmm. and what's going on there and then a lot of uh like anti-refugee demagoguery uh by uh by uh, uh uh Lebanese elites right and I think that I mean Lebanon was not included in uh in the uh, original uh, uh Amman meeting uh it was kind of belatedly uh involved in uh you know the meetings of this arab contact group but i don't even know what it would mean for lebanon to normalize relations with syria anyways right i mean because lebanon uh is um doesn't have things entirely together right now uh so it doesn't really have a foreign policy um, likewise, Turkey, I think that, you know, Turkey's, uh, the, the forced returns, uh, uh, that Turkish authorities have carried out, uh, similarly seem, uh, uh, those seem linked much more towards, uh, to, uh, Turkish domestic politics, right? And then some of those incentives, um, Turkey, uh, you know, notably non-Arab, right? And then not, not, uh, uh, participant in, uh, uh, you know, in some of these, um, you know, these, uh, uh, Arab normalization dynamics. And, uh, mm. so if we have kind of a, a, an Arab discussion of normalization that is, I think, led by the Jordanians, uh, as seems to be the case coming out of, uh, that Amman meeting, uh, and then the, uh, uh the follow-up various meetings between, uh, uh, Safadi and, uh, uh, UNHCR head Grandi. Um, I think uh, he met with Griffiths. 
um, if we have the Jordanians in the lead on this, then I feel relatively sanguine about that because I think that the Jordanians, uh, you know, with some past exceptions, have been much more uh, responsible uh, on this. They are not seemingly, um, you know, inclined to uh, uh, to carry out uh, large scale forced returns. They're also much more uh, responsive uh, to a lot of their Western partners, right? I think that it's much much easier to have mm -hmm. a, a a good dialogue with them uh and then to uh you know to potentially like to influence to weigh in on uh uh whatever moves they might uh, uh they might be considering on refugees in a way that i mean with uh you know in some cases depending on which lebanese authorities or you know with the turkish authorities you cannot right, right. so i think that to have the Jordanians in the lead on this, I think is it's okay. Yeah. Um, let me uh, sort of close out uh, the questioning with a, a broader question. Um, I want to focus it, um, and I'm going to give each person a, a, a minute or two to uh, tackle a, a response to it or uh, conclude with um, other remarks that you'd like to make. Um, but the the uh, implicit focus in a lot of Sam's uh, piece also um, dealt with the, um, the situation of ordinary um, Syrians. Um, according to a recent Human Rights Watch report, there's a growing body of evidence and opinion, at least, among some UN uh, experts, Syrian researchers and Syrian economists, that U.S. sanctions aimed at sectors of the Syrian economy have exacerbated Syria's economic crisis and the misery of ordinary Syrians. Sam's article focuses on Arab normalization. As I said with Jim and others, it doesn't uh, argue for any sort of a, uh, approach from, from the U.S. But I, I, I want to, as we conclude, sort of yank the article this way and that a little bit and um, see, I want people to um, respond to this idea. I guess you would call it the misery argument. Um, if, a, if a policy has not worked to isolate a side, if these are the arguments Sam has used uh, with Arab uh, uh, normalization. Isolation has not worked. Um, improved prospects for holding Assad accountable not worked. Um, achieving political solution for Syria have not worked. Um, should should those arguments be directed, Sam, at um, at U.S. policy or European policy as well? Or do you think, um, as others have, have, and Jim to a certain degree has maintained, um, that U.S. policy and European policy should be left alone and mesh with these Arab normalization policies to that it makes a coherent uh, whole? Um, I'll let each of you take a minute or two to either address that or conclude in uh, the, the way that you would like. Sam, you want to start? Take about a minute and a half. Sure. Well, I mean, I think that I think that it's worth revisiting uh, U.S. and Western sanctions policy. I mean, not because of anything that the Arabs are doing, but just on its own terms. <laughs> um you know, I think that a lot of the work that I've done over the past few years has uh, uh, has been informed by a, uh, a report that I did in 2021 uh, about the drivers of food insecurity in Syria. Um, you know, these these numbers were spiking in like a really uh, alarming way uh, from 2020. Uh, and then I think, you know, and then the uh, what I uh, came to appreciate in the course of this uh, was that, um, you know, that a lot of this food insecurity uh, that people's struggle to eat uh, was because they couldn't afford food, right? That the, that the economy is too flattened, uh, that people are, uh, people are too poor to uh, support themselves and their families. Uh, and thus that, uh, you know, that the health of Syria's uh, economy is a uh, humanitarian concern, right? So I think that um, I think that to the extent, obviously, there are many reasons 
why a uh, uh, Syrian's economy is wrecked. Um, but to the extent that, uh, you know, that we as Americans are contributing to this uh, or, uh, you know, preventing uh, standing in the way of recovery, I think we need to, you know, I think we need to look inward here. Right. Um, that said, you know, I mean, I don't hold out a lot of hope uh, for change on this. Uh, I mean, mainly just for reasons of uh, uh, U.S. domestic politics. Um you know, I do think that, I mean, the Biden administration has seemed, you know, they've done some uh, responsible uh, and I think positive uh, things about sanctions. Uh, I mean, seemingly as much as they can without, you know, kind of uh, uh, reversing their promise to, uh, uh, you know, not to to waive or lift sanctions. But, uh, you know, I mean, like we're... Uh, I mean, the, the, I mean, the truth is that we're part of the problem. Let me um, go to others as they wrap up, as we wrap up here and um, see what their views are on, on what we've talked about, what I asked, and what Sam has had to say. Doreen, you don't you want to weigh in for a minute or so as you conclude? Sure, but I think Ambassador Jeffrey has his hands up, so if you would like to go first, Ambassador Jeffrey, would you like to go first? Sure. Uh, very quickly, because this is very, very important, and it is the major critique of the second purpose of an isolation strategy, which is to block an Assad Putin uh, Supreme Leader win, uh, as opposed to the positive one of providing incentives to get a negotiation underway, which neither we nor so far as we've just spent an hour and a half talking about the Arabs have managed. Uh, the, the problem is, first of all, uh, all uh, human rights and assistance NGOs hate sanctions. It's part of their DNA. They're never going to say anything good about sanctions. Having been the guy who was looking at the specific sanctions and the kind of uh, exceptions we were making, the waivers that we introduced and such, particularly for food, medicine, and other things on a daily basis, I would say I would have to see the statistics and the analysis. Furthermore, uh, one thing I think we can all agree on, uh, and uh, I and uh, others here have heard briefings from uh, Swiss NGOs, uh, that uh, this administration has been particularly leaning over backwards to help on uh, humanitarian and early recovery. They cheat so outrageously that Congress is now uh, pushing through, I don't know if it'll pass, a, uh, a tougher Caesar bill because of mm. all of the uh, uh, Swiss cheese hold. What I'm trying to say is... Uh, how much of the obvious problem with the Syrian humanitarian situation is generated by sanctions, I don't know. What I do know is uh, there are countries in the broader Middle East, Afghanistan and Somalia immediately leap to mind, that were humanitarian disasters before they became geopolitical problems. In fact, they became geopolitical problems as, as well. Syria was doing pretty well. It was a middle-income country in 2011. The reason it is a humanitarian disaster today is first, second, and third Assad. Somewhere down there between five and ten, we may want to throw in the sanctions right. uh, as a contributing factor. Because of that, a policy of lifting the sanctions, which opens up what we were worried about, we just talked about this a bit with the Arab League initiative, uh, a slippery slope of lifting the isolation without getting anything, anything in return, can lead to more of the geostrategic disasters that we've seen in Syria and the resulting massive humanitarian problems. We're talking about half the population are IDPs and refugees. Believe me, whatever percent of the uh, humanitarian problem that is, it's got to be over 80%. Uh, percent. And that's all aside, because those people have fled not because they want better jobs or more, uh, you know, a better diet. They fled because they fear Assad, and the major reason they haven't gone back. Secondary reasons include housing, I admit, but the one we kept hearing, and I think people are still hearing, is we're afraid of Assad. We will be drafted. He will uh, treat us badly, which he will. Thank you, Jim. Uh, Doreen. Well, I'm not going to get into the argument or arguing about whether or not sanctions are good or bad, or who who they're hurting uh, the regime or the ordinary people. But I would like to um, emphasize the point that, um, I mean, as many panelists here argue that 
it's hard to imagine that Western capitals are going to scale back their sanctions. Mm -hmm. um, we, I don't think that's going to happen. Mm -hmm. um, as a matter of fact, as Ambassador Jeffrey pointed out, it might have the opposite effect. Um, there has been a move. Um, there has been a push in Congress, a bipartisan move, as a matter of fact, to strengthen mm -hmm. sanctions further, because this wave of normalization has triggered uh, also reaction from the Syrian diaspora in Washington. There's a lot of, of, of advocacy and lobbying for additional sanctions. Um, and you know what? Putting sanctions aside, um, even if in an imaginary scenario in which I think is highly unlikely to happen that Western capitals remove all their sanctions tomorrow, who's going to invest in Syria? This is mm -hmm. such a poor return on investment. Um, it's a low priority country for, for almost everyone involved. I mean, again, aside from Turkey and Iran. Um, so I don't think, again, it's a sanctions, some sanctions are problematic. Uh, I think more problematic is the lack of an overall strategy, clear objectives. But I, I think it is not the core of the issue. Here. Right. So that's not lose sight. Thank you, Doreen. Uh, Mona, you want to bring things to a close? Sure. Uh, thank you. And let me pick up where, where, where Doreen left off, which is lack of an overall strategy and objectives. And I think that's really the key to all of this discussion, which is essentially I think there's an understanding, a shared understanding that in the region, the, the idea of isolating Assad has run its course and it hasn't produced the results that they were looking for. That said, we have yet to see normalization producing any concrete benefits either. And my own view is that this is because of a lack of strategy, a lack of understanding and engagement concerted engagement by the region and, quite frankly, by the, the U.S. and the EU and others as well. And this revolves around the notion of leverage. And we've had lots of discussions uh, uh, here about what constitutes leverage, how is leverage used, are sanctions leverage? I think there's an argument that can be made that, yes, indeed, they are. Um, are there issues with overcompliance um, with uh, of sanctions and unintended humanitarian impacts? Certainly humanitarian organizations and human rights organizations make that argument. Um, so in all of that, is there space uh, for a deeper dive and a much more concerted diplomatic effort to pull all of these strands together into some sort of concerted strategy that seeks to address this issue of what to do with Syria? My fear is that um, uh, Basically, a lot has already happened. The readmission into the Arab League here, I differ with Sam, symbolically is very important. And in that regard, I think it was a squandered bit of leverage. Um, I also think that Syria falls far lower on the list of priorities uh, for, the, for the Biden administration. And therefore, I don't think we're going to see the kind of concerted diplomatic effort that, in my view, would be critical to beginning to untangle a problem and a challenge as complex as what to do with Assad. Thank you, Mona. I want to thank all of our panelists for uh, participating today. Um, these Syria issues are complex and difficult, and I think we've had a stimulating and very thoughtful discussion. I also want to thank all of our audience for joining us, and we look forward to seeing all of you at our next AGSIW program. Thank you very much.